Got a little breaking news at this hour. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the program. I am Trish Regan. Tucker Carlson commenting on whether or not he is going to be the vice presidential pick, whether or not he would consider it. His, his reply is incredibly interesting. And let's just say my interpretation is that, yeah, his hat is in the ring. I'm going to play it all for you. He just sat down with Roseanne Barr. We're going to get to that. Portions of the show are brought to you by Legacy Precious Metals, LegacyPMInvestments.com, 1-866-589-0560. That's where you need to go if you're worried about inflation. You're trying to find out different ways to maybe hedge your portfolio. One of the things that people tend to look at is often gold, LegacyPMInvestments.com. If you're going to buy gold. These are the guys to talk to. one 5 Okay. So this is very, very interesting. You know, we got a little bit of a tease the other night. What was it? Fight night, right? At Madison Square Garden when we saw this. Not that. How strong that team is. Making his way into the building. One of the bigger mixed martial arts fans. I know President Donald Trump taking his octagon side seat for UFC 295. <laughs> we got two title fights coming up at UFC 295 here in a matter of moments, live from Madison Square Garden. And President Trump will be here to witness Boom, all of it. wow. Okay, so that was the tease. Just a, you know, a couple weeks ago, on a Sunday night in New York City, and now Tucker Carlson just sat down, this is very interesting, with Roseanne Barr, and she asked him the question, as she should. By the way, reminder, if you haven't subscribed, do me the favor of subscribing. We're here live every day. Well, most every day. I think I took yesterday off. <laughs> and starting next week, we're going to have a dedicated time. So make sure that you subscribe to this channel. We're going to be live every day. I think we decided on 1 o'clock. So it would be great to have all of you here. Let's take a look at Tucker Carlson responding to this key question right now. Would he consider running as the vice presidential pick on the Republican ticket with Donald Trump in 2024? Watch his answer. First of all, on the crazy train there, how do you feel about Trump saying he would consider you for vice oh, president? Oh, gosh, I don't know. <laughs> I put that in the category of asteroids striking the earth, <laughs> good or bad. Uh, it's so far out the side, outside of my control that I, you know, would I mean, you, I'm flattered. Yeah, it is flattering, isn't it? For sure. But I mean, it's hard to, you know, I've never been in politics. I've never. Would you ever do it? Would I accept? Yeah, if you really have to ask think you. about that. Um, <laughs> I mean, I spent my whole life looking at politicians and commenting on them and passing judgment on them. And I've never run for you know, room mother. And so the <laughs> idea of that is so far from anything I've ever done. It's kind of hard even to imagine. What do you think? I certainly support Trump. I'll tell you that. And I can tell you, I mean, I've always agreed with Trump's policies always. And I lost friends over it. Um, but, and I've never really actively supported anybody because it's not my job to actively support people. I right. watch, you know, right. I like to watch. Um, <laughs> but I'm a voyeur. Yeah. <laughs> but I became an active Trump supporter when they raided Mar-a-Lago last summer, the summer of 2022. Mm. That, that, that's just, that can't stand. No, that can't. And that I was something. agree with Trump on a lot. But even if I disagreed with Trump on a lot, I'd still be a Trump supporter because you cannot allow that. You cannot allow the you know, the regime, the president of the United States to use the Justice Department to knock the front runner out of the race. You can't do that. No, you can't do that. Wow. So I, it was kind of a nuanced answer. My view on this, I hate to break it to you, that those that love Tucker and those that love Trump, I don't actually think ultimately this would fly for a variety of reasons. One, I think Tucker's right. It's, it's, you know, he, it's not what he does, right? Like he likes to analyze much like me, right? We sit on the sidelines. It's easier over here. Trust me. I actually admire people that go into politics because it's like, whoa, you know, it's tough enough even just being an analyst of this stuff when you're actually in it. Like it's a, it's another ball game altogether, but he likes being on the sidelines and being able to comment. I've often thought in terms of even myself, when people have talked about it, it's like, well, you know what, I have uh, in some ways better and bigger influence over here and I'm completely, completely my own person, right? I, I don't have to answer to a party or to anyone. And these days, not even a network, right? Like think of the freedom in that, 
reminder, ding, 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 to subscribe. I'm just leaving that subscribe thing up there for all of you to see indefinitely if you haven't subscribed, do me that favor. But it's a very different position than actually being in politics. And to his point, like he's never been a room mother. He's able to comment and at times influence in ways that he personally thinks is of value from the sidelines. And so once you cross over into the space of, okay, now you're actually making or influencing policy, like it's a totally different ballgame. And I think that's something that many of us in the media space really don't want to do. I, I, I believe him when he, I don't think he'd want to do that. I also think that he's got enough of a position, right? How many zillion followers does he have now on Twitter where he doesn't have to do that? And I think as many that would like to see him do it, as many as, you know, many of us would love to see that kind of pairing just from a pure spectacle standpoint, right? Can you imagine you want to talk about a lot of oxygen on stage or in the room? It would be very interesting to see, but I don't know is that would be the best possible combination. I see a lot of you making comments and and you guys seem to be agreeing. Don, thank you for uh, reminding people to hit the like button. It's true. Do me that favor. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, all of that. We've been growing, 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 and it's thanks to you and I appreciate that. But anyway, I think that Tucker is a, an extremely smart guy. He understands policy. He understands the media. But whether or not he actually would want to jump into that in such a way that you're actually part of that political cir- circle. I nearly said circus. <laughs> you know it's a circus, right? I, I don't see it, but you know what? I could be proven wrong. I think that there's other contenders out there. You know Byron Donaldson, right, down in Florida, the guy who was almost Speaker of the House. I actually thought he had a shot at getting it. It's just he's young and you know, kind of up and coming. He understands finance. He understands economics. He would be an interesting choice. I think you've got... Uh, the, the governor of South Dakota out there, Kirsty Nome, and she's a very interesting choice and would gel well. A lot of you guys have ma- mentioned Carrie Lake. I mean, there's a lot of options out there, and I think that the, he's going to look very hard. I, I can't imagine there's going to be anybody necessarily on the stage right now with him. Like some people have said, maybe Nikki Haley. I don't see that one happening. Although, hey, you know, it's amazing how people in politics forgive each other. <laughs> I'm always, I'm like, you know, like, I don't know, maybe... Maybe I'm too sensitive. I think I would kind of hold a grudge if somebody said that about my wife or my father, Ted Cruz, I'm looking at you, right? And yet, you know, they move on and maybe that's a good way to be. You know, you you shouldn't necessarily hold a grudge, but they certainly don't in politics. And I I think Trump would just look at it and say, okay, who is going to help me get to the finish line? And he's going to pick the person that's going to help him get to the finish line. And maybe that would be Nikki Haley. I'm not necessarily ruling her out, right? Because there's an establishment class that would be like, okay, okay, we get Nikki there. And, um, you know, it it could be Byron because again, I think he appeals to a lot of different people across a lot of different spaces. So very interesting commentary out of Tucker Carlson, whether or not he's doing it to gain more and more followers. There's been that kind of viewpoint, right? Like, oh, he's just like sort of floating this out there. I don't think that's true. And Maggie Haberman actually from the New York Times recently said on a podcast that this is actually relatively real and that the Trump team would be looking at him. I see Trump as being happy to look at him, but I just don't. Again, never say never. I don't see it fully coming to fruition. I want to talk about, you know, we mentioned his his following on Twitter. I want to talk about Twitter for a moment because you may have seen the news that advertisers are pulling dollars right off of Twitter. And Elon Musk, who needs to make a go of this thing, was just asked about it. And well, you know, (laughs) this is the attitude I'll tell you, you kind of need to have in life right? You, you kind of got just got to stand up. I mean, the guy spent 50 some odd billion dollars on this platform, only in America, right? It's great that he had the deep pockets to be able to do that. Now he's going to make a go of it, but he's got advertisers that are kind of picking him apart and tearing him apart. And yes, he regrets one of the posts that he sent and it kind of got misinterpreted, etc. But, you know, he still said, look, I shouldn't have sent it. But when these companies just keep pulling their ad dollars Well, there's a bad word in here. Watch. All of the criticism, there was advertisers leaving. We talked to Bob Iger today. I hope they stop. You hope? Uh, Don't advertise. You don't want them to advertise? No. What do you mean? 
if, if somebody's going to try to blackmail me with advertising, blackmail me with money, go fuck yourself. But go fuck yourself. Is that clear? I hope it is. Hey, Bob, if you're in the audience. Well, well let me ask you then. Andrew's That's like, what, what? Don't about- advertise. How do you think then about the economics of, of X? Andrew's trying to get if, it together. If, if, if part of the underlying model, at least today, and maybe it needs to shift, maybe the answer is it needs to shift away from advertising. Um, if, if you believe that this is the one part of your business where you will be beholden to those who uh, have this view, G- what do you do? F Y. <gasps> He's doubling I, down. I He's tripling there's a down. Reality too. <laughs> right? Yes. No, no. It, it, I, I mean, I, Linda no, Yaccarino's right here, and she's uh, got to sell uh, advertising. Uh, absolutely. So, <laughs> um, Portland. No, no, totally. So, so no, no, actually, what, what this advertising boycott is, uh, is, is going to do, it's, it's going to kill the company. And do you think that the company... I, I, but, and the whole world will know that those advertisers killed the company, and we will document it in great detail. But there are, those advertisers, I imagine, are going to say, they're going to say, we didn't kill the company. Oh, yeah? They're going to say... Tell it to, the, tell it to Earth. But they're going, to say that, they're going to say, Elon, that you killed the company because you said these things and that they were inappropriate things and that they didn't feel comfortable on the platform, right? That's, that's what and, and they're let, going to say. And let's see how Earth responds to that. So, let me, okay, this, then this... Wow. So um, forgive the language. I I hope we don't get in trouble for that. But look, that was quite, quite a reaction. And Elon Musk is showing that he's kind of just had it. And then he put it right back on. I mean, he's, he's, dare I say, almost even calling for people to boycott the Disney's and the Apple's and the companies that are boycotting Twitter. Very interesting exchange, and you heard him double down once, twice, three times. I mean, I was laughing at Andrew, the reporter from the New York Times and CNBC, who's like, whoa, you know, he's trying to totally keep a straight face, and he he acted very proper, proper, Um, didn't even sort of crack a, a smile, which is sort of funny in and of itself. Anyway, Elon is kind of just saying it like it is, and sometimes you kind of just need to be your own person, and yeah, he can afford to lose that money, but he shouldn't have to because we ought to be able to find a mechanism by which we can have really honest conversations and protect free speech in the ways that it needs to be protected right now. It really does. I mean, and when I say protected, I mean, you got to understand that there's a difference too between some of the the intimidation tactics and speech itself, right? That's important. It's a distinction because when I look at what's happening at Harvard University or UPenn or Columbia, those are bullying, harassment, intimidation tactics directed against Jewish students. When I look at what happened outside at the Christmas tree lighting ceremony in New York City last night, to me, that's intimidation. It's harassment. I mean, can you imagine? I used to walk out of the store. Let me show you what was going on. So they were lighting the tree there at Rockefeller. They had one right outside Fox. And this was the door I used to go in and out of every single day and night. And I wouldn't have liked this. I wouldn't have felt very good about seeing this, guys. <laughs> Wow. Okay. It, you know what that means, what they were chanting. It's basically genocide. And that was right outside Fox News headquarters. So again, I would have been there. It would have been the time that my show used to get off. By the way, if you just found me over here, remember, subscribe, subscribe. My producers are telling me, remember to say that because I always forget. We just start talking and you know, we we go on our, our, on our mission and on our tangents. But I just remember walking in and out of that building. I, it would have been right around, let's see, nine o'clock when I would get off my show. And yeah, that would have felt really intimidating. And then there's additional video where there's some altercations with the police. There's additional video where there's some real symbols of hate that they held up. I don't even want to talk about it and I don't want to show it. And um, But it's there. And the point is like, there's a difference, right, between that kind of vitriol and the fear factor that goes into that versus what 
Elon is trying to talk about, which is that you need to have a space for a lot of different opinion, a lot of different reaction. You need that diversity of thought, if you would. Um, it, it's really, it's just remarkable to see how quickly we are descending. And I really mean that, descending, descending, descending. We've had all kinds of challenges as an economy. There are new numbers out today that suggest the economy is suffering some more. We've got um, some some sales numbers that show that, you know, things are cooling off and, and maybe Maybe that's what the Fed intended. I know that's what the Fed intended because it's trying to reduce inflation. Reminder, if you're worried about inflation, Legacy Precious Metals is the place to go. They've been our sponsor from the very beginning on this show. We love them over there. Charles Thorngren, he's going to be on the show next week. We're looking forward to that. Uh, he's the CEO of the company. But again, you know, this is something that I think is front and center on everybody's mind because you're looking at the economic crisis. You're looking at the border crisis. You're looking at the international crisis and saying, like, how can this be? I do want to just say something very briefly about Henry Kissinger, who has passed away. 100 years old. He made it to the big 100. And I can tell you just a personal story. I, when I was a student at Columbia in New York City, I was living at something called International House in New York. I mean, I had like no money at all. Like, really. I mean, I was, I was, I was working. I was in school. I was paying my own way. And I remember I could afford a room at International House. I couldn't afford the room with the sink. Because that was an extra 50 bucks. But I could afford a room. And it was a teeny tiny little room. And, you know, it was a neat place. It was a neat place to live. It's way up by Columbia there um, in in Manhattan and on Riverside Drive. Neat building. And they had a lot of neat activities because they had a pretty impressive board, of which I believe Kissinger was one of the board members. Well, one night he came and he spoke to a group of us. Maybe 20 of us showed up for that. And I remember thinking, this is amazing. Like this man who has such a wealth of knowledge and it comes from the real politics school, as they call it in international relations, right? Political science, that realism school of which I certainly just subscribe to. And I suspect you do too, if you're watching this channel. I just thought, wow, like he's he's spending time with us here, just some kids, basically, you know, a bunch of students. This would have been back in 1997 or 1998. And it meant a lot to me. And I, you know, over the years have seen many of his interviews, have had many friends that have worked very, very closely with him. One of my dear friends was one of his mentees. And I, I just think that, you know what, it's, it's the passing of a legend. And it's frightening how much the world has changed since he was really at the height of his influence. We need more realism. We need to understand that there are enemies out there. And if we're not careful, they will have an impact that will significantly lessen our quality of life. So, Henry Kissinger, rest in peace. Thank you for talking to me that many eons ago. And thank you for all your work you've done over the years. And I would remind everybody to go back, look at his work, to look at some of his interviews, my gosh, just a few days ago, he was saying, he was saying that, you know, you got to be very careful with immigration and how groups integrate in society, because if you can't integrate and kind of take the best of everyone, right, and emerge as something stronger and better, then you really shouldn't be bringing people in in the first place. And this is coming from somebody who had to escape Germany, right, in World War II. But he was alluding to the challenges, of course, that Germany has had bringing in so many Syrians, or you think about Sweden, et cetera. And again, going back to realism, like, let's just be realist here. Cut to the chase. Don't be selfish about it. Don't think that just because you are so nice and so liberal that your niceness is going to actually change the world in a way that is so fundamentally different. Have some respect, frankly, really, for whatever has been ingrained in a different society that you can't just with the flip of a switch change them overnight. It's not how it works. Kissinger got that. Realists get that. It, it's a form of conceit, frankly, if you ask me, with these liberals that think that, oh, you know, you just kill him with kindness and, and just give him more handouts and then everybody's happy and you don't have any problems anymore. No, it's much, much bigger than that. Much bigger than that. Anyway, may Kissinger rest in peace. May this world 
find a better place. Thank you so much to all of you for being here. I put Don's comment up there. Thank you, Don, for encouraging everybody to to be here. Michael Donald, thank you. We're going to start having a normal time. How's that sound, right? It's going to be better, right? For <laughs> It's going to be better for all of us and, and, and for me as well. I'm thinking about 1 p.m. starting on Monday. We'll see what happens tomorrow, but 1 p.m. starting Monday, everyone. We'll soon put it up, and then you can just know that we're going to be here live every single day, but do what you can. Let me know in the comments below or in the chat, but probably in the comments below if you're, you're seeing this after the live show, whether or not you think Donald Trump should pick Tucker Carlson for vice president. You know, I mean, unless something really strange happens, you know that Donald Trump is probably going to be on the top of that ticket. The question becomes, Who is number two on the ticket? Should it be Tucker? Should it be someone else? Let me know in the comments. Thank you so much to all of you for being here. It really does mean a lot. And we will talk again tomorrow.